please join me in welcoming Professor Scrantney. Thanks uh, for that introduction, uh, Keo. I, I also want to um, thank Jane for all the hard work she did in arranging this. Jane, I've given a lot of talks, and I've always had water. I've never had ice in the water. <laughs> this is not a cocktail. This is uh, just uh, ice water, but it, it's going to keep me refreshed. And um, I also wanted to say it's very nice to be at the University of Michigan. I'd only visited Ann Arbor once before. Um, but in fact, uh, my father and my grandfather went here. So there's some Wolverine, uh, there's some Wolverine blood inside me. Um, what, what I'm going to be doing today, um, uh, you know, like guests on talk shows, they always go on there and they try to sell a new movie or uh, they try to sell a new book that they wrote. Um, I don't actually expect you to buy this special issue of a journal that I edited, um, but uh, you can. Um, this was something that um, the center that I direct, that um, Keo mentioned, the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies, this is something we did. Um, uh, a couple, we had a conference a couple years ago. We brought in leading scholars from Japan who study immigration and immigration-related issues and some scholars in the United States, and we wanted to put together a comparative project that looked at these two countries side by side. And we wanted to look at these two countries side by side because they're especially interesting countries um, to compare on the question of immigration. The United States is, uh, in terms of sheer numbers, the world leader in immigration. We, we get more immigrants than, than any other country, and I think number two is Russia, and we get twice as many as, as those guys do. Japan is famous for, for not having so many immigrants. And that's my first slide here. This was put together by uh, my uh, colleague, colleague and sometimes co-author, Dong Hun Sol, in South Korea. Um, we did something, that, as you can see, it doesn't make much sense. There's dots all over this thing. Um, but economists will tell you that immigration is typically driven by wage differentials. That is, folks move to a country where they can earn more money for the amount of work that, that, they, would, that they would normally put in in their own home country. And so usually migration moves from uh, poorer countries to more wealthy countries. And so we just thought, well, let's look at, you know, the percentage of immigrants in a country and, um, and put that on the y-axis, on the x-axis. We're going to look at per capita uh, GDP and see what the, the numbers show us. Um, as you can see, it doesn't explain too much, um, but it does explain a little bit, and it highlights what I want to uh, discuss today. And that is that um, Asian countries uh, can be quite wealthy, but uh, compared to other countries in the world, um, they uh, don't accept that many immigrants. So we've got a lot of wealth concentrated in Asia, in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. And there's a lot of folks who want to earn a lot of money, especially in China. Um, but a lot of those people are going to um, Europe or, or North America rather than, than to Japan. So we were, we were interested in, 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 this, in this comparison, trying to understand this. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little brief overview of what the talk's going to be about. Um, and my contribution, the stuff that uh, I did in the intro to this volume, um, is going to provide what I hope will be a useful conceptual framework for understanding um, how Japan and actually all countries in the world um, make immigration policy, sort of like Weberian uh, ideal types for the sociologists in the audience. Just a concept to help us uh, illuminate differences and highlight similarities. I'm also going to describe the work of one of the scholars that we brought over to San Diego um, who analyzed uh, the role of low-skilled migrants to Japan, so manual workers and service workers. Um, I'm also going to talk a bit about the role of high-skilled migrants to Japan using the work of a scholar that we brought to, uh, brought to our conference. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, possible substitutes for immigration. What has Japan done so that it could have the, one of the largest economies in the world without relying on migrants to the same degree as, as other countries? Um, what sort of substitutes have they used and what, what, what's going to happen in the future? And then I'm going to show some of the challenges that, that Japan is likely to face with its current uh, immigration policy. It's, it's a topic that's almost certainly going to rise in public importance um, in Japan. So <clears throat> let me just say a few things. So we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about um, the role of migrants, but in the background is always going to be a concern that I have um, on the, uh, the making of immigration policy in Japan. And just a little um, political sociology 101, um, when, we're, when we're talking uh, about how policy is made, um, 
there's a lot of different factors that we could focus on that can help us understand how we get a particular policy output. And the standard approach that um, political scientists uh, pioneered um, way back in the 1950s is simply to look at interest groups. Look at the most powerful organized groups in society. What are they pushing for? Um, does the policy follow their interests? Um, if you're interested in democratic theory, you might say, well, what do the people want? What's the will of the people? Does uh, public opinion support a high or a low um, uh, rate of immigration in a country? In most countries in the world, there's more immigration than the public actually wants. So a lot of folks say, well, it looks like interest groups tend to be more important than public opinion, but the public opinion is not going to put up with, with anything. And then another factor is the shape of political institutions. How, how easy is it for an interest group to, to make uh, their, their uh, interests or their goals known? How easy is it for the public uh, to, to exert an influence on the policymaking process? And that's certainly a factor in immigration policy in Japan and other places as well. All these things matter, but I'm more interested in something else, something that kind of goes into the background a little bit. Um, one of the guiding principles I've always used in my social science is something I read. Um, it was attributed to the sociologist Karl Mannheim, who, uh, who said that the most important thing you can know about a person is what that person takes for granted. And that's kind of what I'm going to be doing today, is trying to look at unspoken sort of cultural models. Um, uh, sociologist Frank Dobbin calls them policy paradigms. Um, I'm going to use a less jargony term, but just talk about the philosophies of immigration policy um, in Japan. You know, sort of, they don't even need to be said, but sometimes they can be teased out, and sometimes they're, they're actually made um, quite explicitly. Now, I want to emphasize that these, when I use the word philosophy, so we might think of, you know, Heidegger or Hegel or Plato <laughs> or something like that. In policymaking, there might be a philosophy of, of immigration. Um, it's not necessarily coherent. It doesn't necessarily fit together. Sometimes it'll be contradictory. Um, sometimes a particular policy will sort of be an instantiation of two different philosophies at the same time, and I'm going to point that out. But that doesn't mean that these sort of cultural boundaries are, or uh, uh, assumptions don't matter. Um, I argue that they, they create a kind of set of boundaries beyond which policymakers will not cross or they'll be afraid to cross or they'll realize, they'll realize it's very perilous and risky to cross that policy boundary. So there's a lot of complexity here, but it doesn't mean that these philosophies don't matter at all. And so you can kind of identify different patterns in different countries. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Now, I wanted to um, start off with uh, um, um, a little basic um, framework here for thinking about what policymakers are struggling with when they're making immigration policy. Um, this is a little diagram uh, that represents something that um, you may have had in your mind when, uh, or if or when you read John Locke or um, Hobbes or some of these uh, early modern um, political thinkers in the West who talked about you know, what are, the, what are the philosophical foundations of government and, and how is it that people emerged from a state of nature and set up a government? So I just want to get you to think about, okay, we've got the people and we've got the government. We have the state. But it's important to emphasize that people are united. They're linked to their state. They're linked to their state through citizenship. It's a kind of formal membership in a political community. And as be part of being a citizen in a state, you're going to get some things from the state. You are going to get political rights, the right to vote, the right to choose who is, who is pulling the policy levers in that state. Uh, you're going to get civil rights. You're going to get guarantees of protections on free speech and freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, these sorts of things in a liberal state. Uh, and in a lot of places, you're going to get some guarantees of economic or social rights. That is, the state's going to provide for you health care, old age pensions, uh, disability insurance, and things of that nature. At the same time, should have probably put arrows going down and arrows going up, um, the citizens give to the state as well. And if you watched the debate last night, there was a lot of discussion about taxes. The state is funded by the taxpayers, and the, the citizens are, are, for the most part, taxpayers. And, and so they, are, uh, they have money extracted from the state, so there's an arrow going up as well. And, um, and they also have duties, military duties um, in the United States, jury duty and things of that nature. Now, 
In the modern world, we have these formal memberships and these citizenship uh, communities, um, but they're always in a geographical territory. There's a specific chunk of land over which the state has sovereignty and control. And then here's where we get to the immigration story. There's a lot of these. And at different points, members of one of these communities is going to go to another one, go to, a, go to a host state. And there's all kinds of difficult questions that arise then. Whom should the state in the middle, call that one the, the host state, whom should they welcome? Should they, you know, just these folks or those folks as well? Should we exclude people from particular nation states? Should we target those who, uh, who have the most uh, economic benefit for us? Should we accept everybody? Should we let them bring their family members? Should we give them the same rights that the citizens have? Should we let them stay as long as they want to? There's all kinds of difficult questions that come up when the policymakers in the state in the middle decide whether some of these folks from these other places can come into their territory. Okay? And that brings us to then uh, these philosophies of, of immigration. And the first one, um, I'm calling it uh, economic uh, utilitarianism. Um, you may remember utilitarianism as this basic idea that, uh, we sh that we should do the thing that brings the greatest good to the greatest number. Whoops. <clears throat> so, so the goal of an economic, economic utilitarian immigration policy is basically to maximize wealth for the host state. Let's bring in the immigrants. Let's organize that, uh, that flow of people from these other states um, in a way that maximizes our wealth. And in this philosophy of immigration, it's okay if the culture or the society gets disrupted in some way. Um, even if suddenly there's whole new neighborhoods and different languages on signs, uh, public signs, uh, even if, uh, even if you know, political organizations representing different cultures, even those things form, so what? It's fine, it's, it's boosting the economy, it's, it's, it's helping uh, the greatest, it's providing the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, domestic workers, and by that I just mean the, the local citizens, um, some of them may experience a job loss uh, if an immigrant worker is cheaper. Uh, some of them may experience declines in wages because now there's uh, a greater uh, labor supply. Um, from an economic utilitarian point of view, that's okay as long as it's providing greater wealth uh, for, for everybody. Now, there's two different types of economic utilitarianism, I think. Um, Policymakers who are trying to promote the greatest good for the greatest number and trying to promote um, uh, uh, wealth, um, that could lead them in two different directions. One direction is to say, let's open our borders. Let's, let's let folks come. Let's let employers hire whomever they want to. Um, in this sense, they're focused on the amount of wealth that's being created. But there's another kind of, that's, I'm calling that expansive economic utilitarianism. There's another approach, though, that tries to minimize costs. Um, it has a more statist, you know, strong government control. Um, it focuses on immigrants just coming as temporary foreign workers, as guest workers. And the idea here is have them come. Don't let them bring their families. Children are expensive. You have to school them. They get sick. They'll have to go into the hospitals. You have to give them health care. Um, don't let them stay there and get old. Then we've got to pay them pensions and health, you know, health care when they get older as well. Um, in both of these things, either open borders or more closed, uh, policymakers can be guided by this notion of trying to maximize wealth. Now, in this view, immigrants themselves, um, they're really tools. They're really objects. And, and they're there to aid growth. They're almost like uh, cogs in a machine or something. So rights are, are, are de-emphasized in, in this viewpoint. Um, and this is a sort of a default view of economists. When you read economists talk about immigration policy, this is sort of their expectation that, well, we should do the right policy that'll bring the most, um, the most wealth for the community. Um, in San Diego, I was watching uh, KPBS as our uh, local uh, public television affiliate, and there was a little panel discussion on immigration going on, and they had an audience, um, and this guy kind of like, uh, you know, those daytime talk shows, guy goes into the audience, would put a microphone in people's face, and they would ask questions to the panel of experts. And, um, and one person in the audience was very agitated about American immigration policy, and he, and he was saying, 
we need more workers. Obviously, we're not getting the workers that we need. That's why there's this undocumented workers. We, we need an immigration po policy that supplies the workers for the economy. Um, and, uh, and I remember the interviewer who was you know, just a journalist, but the interviewer said, is that what immigration policy is for? And put the microphone to this guy. And the guy was like, I don't know, uh, I guess. I mean, he never really thought of it. It's sort of an unspoken kind of philosophy that he had. So what else could he have thought of? What else could he have said? That person in the audience could have said, well, you know what? Uh, immigration policy um, should be about rights. It should be about um, a goal of protecting the rights of migrants rather than maximizing wealth. Um, maybe the rights of domestic citizen um, workers or maybe both of these things. Maybe that's what immigration policy, policy should be about. So this is a different philosophy, a different approach, different goal. And in this view, you know, we, we're, these folks are, are willing to sacrifice some uh, economic um, growth. Um, they may also sacrifice some cultural stability um, if rights are protected. And so multicultural policies can disrupt the stability of the culture. Letting in a lot of migrants, letting in their, their family members because they have a right to family unification could, could sacrifice um, economically a little bit. Um, there's sometimes there can be a conflict between the rights of migrants and uh, domestic workers who might lose their job. Um, so these folks might, be, uh, rights liberals might be in conflict with each other. There's, there might be in conflict with taxpayers who have to foot the bill for some of these rights. In this view, immigrants are citizens. Um, I mean, so, sorry, in, immigrants and citizens are people with rights. They're not just tools that are designed to maximize wealth. And this is sort of the default view of, of lawyers or attorneys. When they think about migration, they think about, you know, who's getting screwed here and who's being hurt and how can I make a buck off of, uh, off of this situation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third, and this is the last one. This is the last immigration philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm calling this one communitarianism. And I kind of struggled with that, and I mentioned it once at a conference, and someone yelled at me, and that's not communitarianism. Um, it's the best thing I could come up with, and I even read like Amitai Etzioni, who's a big communitarian, to see if it fit, and I think it kind of fits. But the goal here is uh, to protect a, a collective good that's different from wealth. The goal here is to protect the national culture, social order, keeping things stable, or the feeling of togetherness that people in a political community might have, or all three of these things. So, it, so it's different. Um, economic growth might be sacrificed. Um, migrant rights might be sacrificed in this view in order to bring about these collective, um, these collective goods. And uh, this can come out, this can come, uh, it can be the justification for two different types of uh, immigration policy. Uh, one is a highly restrictive one. If you're worried about maintaining the stability of your national culture, if you're worried about making sure that social order is not disruptive, um, disrupted, one of the things you can simply do is keep migrants out as much as possible. Another thing you can do, and this is a more progressive communitarian uh, attitude, and this is what Etzioni um, promotes, is you could compel or encourage the assimilation or integration of these foreigners. So they come, but then they're, they're made into a full member of that community including their identities, and so this minimizes cultural disruption. It, it helps uh, encourage cohesion um, of, of, these, of these migrants. In this view, immigrants are people, so they share that with rights uh, liberals, but, but they're different, and they might be threatening. And this is kind of the default view of uh, many citizens uh, around the world. <clears throat> You know, they, they, especially people don't make that much money. Their local community is so important to them, and when they lose that, that th this is a major injury that they might have. All right, so let's start talking about Japan. Now, Japan is a very interesting case for scholars of immigration. Um, it shares with most developed states um, a shrinking labor force. Um, most demographers um, predict that the Japanese labor force b between now and 2055 is going to shrink by almost half. Um, workforces are shrinking all over the developed world, but Japan especially um, uh, has a low birth rate and, um, and there's major concerns about that. Not only are the number of workers shrinking, but the workforce is becoming more educated. This is another phenomenon that's happening in the United States and it's happening in Europe as well. 
Um, and that's generally a good thing, but one of the one of the problems is that there's fewer low-skilled workers to go around. The people who help clean this building, uh, people who help uh, do agricultural work or or serve us food in a restaurant. There's fewer folks who are who are going to be satisfied doing that because they've been educated to do more than that. Japan shares with other developed countries uh, a growing demand for for skilled migrants, um, particularly information technology or IT workers. Um, there's, there's a phrase that's being used a lot in, in, in um, the EU and in the United States, and people talk about a global, a global battle or race for talent where different countries are trying to attract the most skilled workers all over the world. Japan's part of that. Because the Japanese society is, is, is shrinking, it's, it's also aging, and this is a major concern in Japan. Um, economists and demographers talk about a dependency ratio, the number of workers there are compared to the number of people who are relying on pensions. Japan's is about 1.3, meaning there's about 1.3 workers uh, for every retired person now, and that's going to become a major problem because it's hard to finance a pension system. <coughs> and because of all these problems, uh, some, some political leaders in Japan are starting to say, we're going to have to do something about this. And uh, some members of the Liberal Democratic Party, not the whole party, but, but a group of them, in 2008 came out with a plan in which they said, we got to start letting in more, more migrants. And um, the number that they came up with was about 10 million um, within the next 40 years. Um, the UN has some other projections saying that Japan needs even more than this. Um, but there's, there's a lot of concerns and people thinking that immigration is a solution here. All right, so let's, let's start talking a little bit about um, about uh, the uh, the manuscript here. <clears throat> so one of the uh, scholars who we uh, who we brought in um, was um, he's an economist named Yasushi Aguchi, and uh, he's actually one of the leading pol immigration policymakers in Japan. Encyclopedic knowledge of what's <coughs> happening um, in the Japanese um, workforce and the role of immigrants in it. And he points out that um, that. Uh, Japan kind of, it's for decades now, it's had a, an official stance that Japan will not admit low-skilled migrant workers. It's just not something that they're going to do. And for many decades, um, in, for industries that were having trouble finding workers, the Japanese government encouraged these industries to leave Japan, to set up production uh, in another country. And um, a lot of folks credit much of the development of East Asia um, they credit this policy for the, for the development. So Taiwan and China more recently, a lot of investment from Japanese companies and, and outsourcing of, of manufacturing there so that Japan didn't have to rely on bringing in these low-skilled workers um, onto the Japanese uh, mainland. So who are these, these folks? Japan has an official policy of no low-skilled migration, but there's a lot of folks who are foreign and who are doing low-skilled work, Japan just simply doesn't call them low-skilled migrants. And the first of these groups, um, the first of these group are called the Nikkeijin. And the Nikkeijin are actually ethnic Japanese. Um, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the United States um, was receiving a lot of Japanese uh, immigrants. Um, but the U.S. government started to exclude Japanese. And so um, uh, Japanese who wanted to emigrate had to find a new destination to go to. And a lot of them started to go to uh, Brazil in South America. And a lot of them started to go to Peru. And so now some ethnic Japanese have been in these places uh, for multiple generations, up to, up to three generations is what the, what the policy specifies. Um, and, and the official visa for these folks is, is for visitation or kind of visiting, you know, visiting family or becoming reacquainted with the culture. Um, but in practice, these ethnic Japanese from Brazil and Peru, there's a few from Ecuador as well, um, they end up supplying a lot of low-skilled migrant labor in Japan. Yeah. I'm actually Sorry? I'm not Nikkei from Mexico. Oh, really? Okay. Well, well, there's not too many of you guys. Yeah, not too many, but I know lots of Indian and Indian people back to Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and probably some of them are mixed, like, yeah. So there's, there's a, it's kind of a fiction that they're ethnically Japanese, um, uh, but in fact, a lot of them are actually mixed. Um, 
uh, a lot of them don't speak Japanese anymore. I don't know if you speak, do you speak Japanese? No, yeah, so that's, that's also pretty common. You've been there generations. Um, so uh, it, eventually you start, to, you start to lose touch. Um, and so, uh, so these folks, but, but they're more Japanese than, than um, someone else from Mexico or, or Ecuador or Brazil or Peru or something like that. So that's a major part of the low-skilled migrant workforce. Japan also created this policy. Um, officially, it was designed to train um, foreigners in some kind of trade of some kind with a Japanese company, and then they would go back to their homeland and, uh, and, and work for that Japanese company company at, at, its, um, at its production facilities in, their, in the immigrants' homeland. But in fact, these, these trainees are really pretty much just low-skilled workers. They come and do simple kind of manual tasks and, um, and supply uh, a, a lot of the low-skilled migrant labor without being called officially a low-skilled um, immigrant. The next category are students. There are a lot of um, foreign students in Japan, many from China. China's the largest uh, sending state um, for students in Japan. And their visa allows them to work. And uh, a lot of the students, these foreign students, um, will go to school, but they'll also work in restaurants or do kind of simple clerical work or something like that while they're, while they're in Japan. And then another, um, another category are the undocumented. Uh, compared to the United States, Japan does a much better job of controlling migration. Um, there's about 2 million foreigners in Japan, only about 100,000 or so are, are undocumented. But that's still a pretty significant part of their low-skilled uh, workforce. So what do they do? Um, a little bit more than a third of them are working in manufacturing in Japan. Um, other services include things um, such as you know, cleaning kinds of services, um, basic kind of uh, nurses' aides and that sort of thing. Um, Restaurant and hotel, uh, the, uh, the, like the foreign students I just mentioned, um, a lot of them also work in retail and wholesale at you know, little shops around town. <clears throat> now, these workers are not uh, all equal. Um, the Nikkeiji and the ones who have some ethnic Japanese ancestry, they're the only ones who can bring family members. So they're the most privileged of the low-skilled <laughs> workers in Japan. Um, the trainees are probably, uh, probably the most limited. Um, I say their trainees can't move. What I mean there is they are brought in by a specific firm and they have to work for that firm. They can typically only stay for uh, one to three years and, um, and they don't have any option of, of moving to a different firm. If they want to do that, they have to go home and then reapply to be a trainee um, with, with another firm. So there's not much um, uh, serious rights protection going on here for this um, low-skilled migrants as a category. And that means that the immigration philosophy that's guiding um, Japan's uh, immigration policy toward low-skilled workers is a, is a kind of restrictive economic utilitarianism. It's designed to limit um, uh, the costs of migrants, so they, limiting their family members really helps limit the costs. And there's also a kind of communitarianism here. Uh, migrants cannot bring their family members. They're, they're, their, their presence in the society is pretty much minimized to the extent to which um, they're contributing to the economy. And so they're, therefore the cultural and the social order are not threatened. Okay, we also, uh, when we had our conference, we brought in um, uh, uh, another uh, leading immigration scholar in Japan. Nana Oishi, actually, and uh, Yasashi Yaguchi are both um, very active in the policymaking uh, circles in Japan. And um, Nana produced a really excellent paper on Japan's attempts to bring in high-skilled workers. Here the official policy is very different from that toward low-skilled migration. Um, the official policy is really one about openness. It's about encouraging uh, foreigners with, with skills to come to the country. Um, one of the things that they offer that low-skilled migrants um, can't do is, is to be able to get visas that they can renew as many times as they need to. Japan is actually more uh, open than many other countries uh, in Europe in that if you're a skilled migrant, you can naturalize and become a Japanese citizen, a full member of that political community um, after only five years. And it's also okay to bring your family members um, if, you're a, if you're a skilled migrant. So very open uh, kind of policy toward um, skilled migrants in Japan. Um, despite this, Japan has had a lot of trouble attracting skilled migrants. Um, only about 9% of the 2 million foreigners um, in Japan are in the skilled category, and as I'll show later, that's actually kind of an overestimate of, of how many um, skilled workers there are. Um, and this isn't 
th this doesn't doesn't do very well compared to other countries. So, for example, Germany is doing is much doing much better than Japan in terms of attracting these kinds of skilled workers. Now, the reasons for this are really complex. What what, what Nana did is what she went and interviewed a large number of skilled workers. Um, she looked at some survey data and put all this together and created this long list of factors um, which together dissuade skilled migrants from coming to Japan. So the official policy is open. The immigration philosophy there is openness toward these folks. But there's other factors that keeps them from coming in large numbers. Uh, number one is language. Uh, the language of the Japanese workplace um, is Japanese. There, there's some companies that have tried to create a kind of dual language sort of workplace. Um, not many foreigners know Japanese, and so they, they really struggle in this situation. I think Nissan is one of the countries that have tried, or one of the companies that's tried to create a kind of um, dual language, allow English to be spoken in, in the workplace. So that's tough. That's tough for someone to feel like they're, they're a part of the, the, the company and the organization. Um, the visas that uh, skilled migrants will get will, will tend to limit them to a particular job, so it's hard for them to move around and look for, um, look for uh, um, a different opportunity, so they're kind of locked into that company that, that hired them. Low starting salaries is another factor. Um, uh, many Japanese corporations have this notion that you start uh, at, at the bottom of the ladder and you work your way up and your salary goes up. Um, the longer you're there, and so a lot of these migrants start at the bottom rungs of this ladder, and they end up making about up to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars less than they would in other countries like the United States or Canada or the UK. So, so starting salaries is another factor dissuading these folks from coming. There's a sense that among these workers that it'll be hard for them to get promoted. They don't really understand how to work their way um, up through the uh, the corporate hierarchy. Uh, many of them will bring their children. Um, it's very expensive to send their kids to private schools, so they'll send their kids to a public school. They often um, are worried that their kids are going to stand out, that they're going to be different. There's concerns that, that their kids will be bullied. Um, there's concerns that their kids will be immersed in a, in a Japanese culture, and, and uh, it'll be hard for them to bring them back home because they haven't been exposed to great diversity. This is what the uh, Nana's uh, respondents say. The pension system. Despite the openness of the immigration uh, policy, the pension system discourages high-skilled migrants from coming, and that is because that in order to collect on it, you have to work for, for several years, like about 25 years. And so uh, a, a skilled migrant will be taxed on their, on their earnings, but they can't bring that Social Security back home. Um, a lot of countries, like the United States, for example, have these agreements with other countries and like transferring these sort of Social Security things back and forth across uh, borders. Japan um, will have, has done that only with a very few countries. Um, taxes. If you're a foreigner in Japan, according to um, uh, Nana Oishi's respondents, um, after about five years, you can be taxed for your assets that you hold in your home country. And so if you, if you want to work for a long time, eventually you're going to have to start reporting on that house that you, that you have back in the United States or in India or something like that. And um, so the tax rates will be higher in Japan than, in, um, than they would be in a different country. And then there's this concern about work-life balance, that, uh, that there's a sense that you put in your hours at a Japanese corporation, um, and then you also put in this extra time after work, um, which is expected of you, and so you end up spending so much of your life at work that you kind of lose touch with your family. And a lot of skilled immigrants say, we don't want to, we don't want to participate in that. Um, now, the philosophy of this, of the policy for high skilled migration, as I said, it's a kind of expansive economic utilitarian. It's trying to maximize the wealth for Japanese society. It just doesn't fit that well with other policies that exist in the government and some, some of the social practices. Um, now, this is a, this is from Nana Oishi's um, research. She basically breaks down what these skilled migrants are doing in Japan. Um, the engineers and the skilled labor categories, that's pretty much what a lot of the uh, uh, skilled migration policies are trying to attract. Um, the specialist in humanities and international services, that sounds kind of fancy. Are these like poets or you know, liter literary theorists? Um, uh, it's neither of those. Those are mostly just entry level clerical workers. So the, the low numbers of skilled migrants um, in Japan actually, they're even lower because almost a third of them aren't doing the things that the skilled migration policy was designed to do, which is to bring in IT workers and, and um, folks who, uh, who will innovate and drive a, an information economy. Now this I thought was a really interesting thing. Nana found this 
um, ranking of different countries uh, based of, on their attractiveness to highly skilled migrants. The number on their right is an overall score for how attractive um, a country uh, is. Um, and uh, so I think it's on a scale of 10. And um, you can see the top, uh, the, the top five there, um, four of them are English speaking. Uh, Switzerland, I think they've got pretty low taxes um, from what I understand. I don't have any bank accounts there or anything, but, uh, but that's attractive to a lot of folks. Um, and then we've got some statistics on Asia. How does Japan do uh, compared to other Asian countries? And you can see it's not very, it's not very well. Um, China's more attractive. Malaysia's more attractive. Thailand, Taiwan. South Korea is more attractive to high-skilled migrants than, than Japan is. So if you want to attract high-skilled migrants to, to grow your economy, you've got a lot of work cut out for you um, because of these factors. Okay, Toshi Shinkawa, um, he's a political scientist, and um, he contributed a paper on, on possible substitutes for immigration. What can Japan do um, if they don't want immigrants? And he had some nice um, public opinion data. They had some polls on the um, liberal democratic Parties plan to bring in 10 million immigrants. Um, more than three quarters of Japanese said 10 million immigrants is too many for Japan to accept. Um, and there's a, the other polls show that immigrants should be the last resort if there's some labor scarcity in the country. So what are the other options? <clears throat> One of them is to have uh, workers work longer. If the, your society is aging, why don't we just utilize that aging workforce? Um, and as you can see here, uh, we, you know, we can target these workers who are more older than 60. Um, in Japan, already 70% <coughs> of men aged 60 to 64 are in the workforce. Um, as you can see, that's quite a bit higher than the United States and way higher than, than, than France. 17%, um, amazing. Um, so Japan's already utilizing a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of its older workers for the, to, to make up for the shortfall. And then there's a general sense that you, know, you can't just replace younger workers with older workers. As, as we get older, as we all know, our bodies start to break down. We start to lose the ability to, to put in the same amount of um, effort and, and uh, produce the same amount of productivity as younger workers. So it doesn't look like tapping the supply of elderly workers in Japan is going to be a, an effective substitute. So how about women? Um, there seems to be some potential there. Uh, about 60% of women of working ages uh, work in Japan. In most EU countries, it's closer to 80. Um, Japan is, is higher than some of the southern European countries like Greece and Spain and Italy. Um, but almost all the rest of Europe, Netherlands, UK, Germany, um, the, the percentages are quite a bit higher than Japan. So there's an there's a, uh, untapped workforce here. Um, Japanese women tend to enter the workforce in high numbers. They tend to drop out. It's called a U-shaped curve. They tend to drop out when they have a baby, and then it recovers a bit, but not all the way. So, there, so the workers are there. there there's some, there's some uh, workforce to be exploited here. Um, but if you ask women why aren't they working, it's part of, part of what they're going to tell you is that they need more support from the government or from their husbands to help with the child care. Um, the... Uh, there, there simply aren't the kinds of welfare state sort of policies that exist um, in Europe. Um, most of the reports, um, I feel like this is kind of a minefield to talk about, but uh, most of the reports will say that women will complain that their husbands don't want to be a part of the child care. The, their workplace sort of demands that they spend time at work and then work afterwards, or spend time socializing afterwards, so it's hard for them to participate in the child care. Um, and then there seems to be a cultural difference here um, with Japan in that there's very little immigrant child care. All over Europe, there's foreign nannies taking care of babies. And Japan has really resisted this trend. And then there's the concern that if we're going to use women to substitute for migrants, well, Japan already has a, a very low birth rate, below replacement level. It's about 1.2, 1.1, around there. Um, and if we get women working more, it's probably going to go down even more. So there's a sense that women aren't going to be um, aren't going to be able to provide the solution for this. So, to me, the big, there's a really big question here, and I haven't seen scholars really address it. And that is, do the migrant workers that the LDP is saying that Japan needs in very large numbers, do they have to stay? Or can they just sort of rotate in and out like these trainees do now? 
Can they just sort of come as a single worker, work there for a few years, be taxed, <coughs> not bring their, their crying babies with their sniffles and their earaches and all that sort of stuff, not bring them in the schools and suddenly the teacher has to like teach Japanese to a kid who doesn't speak Japanese. Um, not someone who's going who's gonna to retire in Japan and, and add another person who drains on the pension system. Can we just rotate in people of working age and supply Japan with the economic human resources that it needs to continue to grow, um, provide a tax base for the pension system? And this is the kind of policy that uh, Japanese immigration philosophy would direct us toward. If you're going to go toward a... Uh, uh, a restrictive economic utilitarianism, such as Japan does with its low-skilled workers, um, this is what you'd want to do. You'd want to rotate in these single low-skilled workers. You'd want to tax their earnings. You'd avoid their dependents, and you would avoid their retirements. And this would also fit with Japan's sort of communitarian approach, where they want to maintain social cohesion and cultural stability. Um, if you keep them uh, without their children, you can, uh, you can sort of keep them sort of separate from the mainstream of society. Um, you avoid the need for multicultural policies. They become, you know, almost self-sufficient. Um, and, uh, and the culture is disrupted minimally. Well, one approach, another approach, too, that would fit with this is, um, is we'll just keep bringing in more, more Nikkei-jin. We're running out of Nikkei-jin. <laughs> um, there's, there's, a, there's, on, there's only there's a few hundred thousand in Japan now. I think there's only about a million, two million total in um, all of Latin America. And, um, there's only 6,000 in Mexico. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, a, an economist um, looked at, at the Nikogen and tried to um, see, well, how many would we need in order to, to make up for this? And you would need six time, 16 times more than exist. So... The Nikkei-jin aren't going to be able to uh, aren't going to be able to provide this. Now, if one big question is, do the migrants have to stay? And if we say, well, no, we can kind of do what Japan's already doing, then you've got um, this other very big question, which is, could a parallel migrant society that sort of exists with the mainstream Japanese society exist on a mass basis? Could you have millions of people? Right now, Japan only has 2 million foreigners. Could you have 10 million foreigners who are single men, single women, or they have their children back home and they rotate in and out, um, who don't go into the schools, who don't really learn Japanese, but are kind of insulated from the, the wider society? Could that exist? It's a major, major issue facing Japan. Something's going to have to give. Either they're going to have to go that route, um, or they're going to have to change Japanese society and start accepting immigrants um, in really large numbers. Now, I don't want to, I just want to give a little uh, sense of compa uh, comparison here. I'll just do this quickly. Got a few minutes left. Um, I, I don't mean to criticize Japan. America's immigration policy is a, is a mess. Um, on the high skilled front, we look a lot like Japan. Um, we have an expansive uh, economic utilitarianism. We're trying to attract these folks. We've got H-1B visas. We, companies can use, can give a green card to a skilled worker. Um, so we're pretty similar to Japan on that front, except we're way more successful. The United States, a lot of folks have been saying this, we owe uh, our economic vitality to our ability to attract skilled workers from around the world. That may be changing. There's a lot of concern that Skilled Indians and Chinese are going back to India and China because they have greater opportunities, but right now we're still doing a pretty good job of attracting those folks. If you look at our overall visa policy, it's, about, it's really about rights liberalism. The, the main way to get to the United States legally is through family reunification. Like that is the bedrock of American immigration policy. More than two-thirds of immigrants come here because they had a family member who's able to sponsor them. Um, to say what you will about American divorce rates and all this sort of stuff, the family is really the foundation of American immigration policy and very different from Japan in that perspective. Um, on the other hand, we've got the situation of undocumented immigration, and here's where the contradictions really come together. Uh, it's got an expansive kind of economic utilitarianism. You know, officially they can't come in, but in fact we let them in, we look the other way. The budget for Homeland Security on, in, on um, investigating workplaces is, is microscopic. So I'm sure there's thousands of undocumented workers in, in Ann Arbor. You probably, you know, in most of the restaurants and the kitchens, they're all, they're all over. And um, that, helps, uh, that helps grow uh, the American economy. 
And there is some sort of migrant rights liberalism in that we tolerate them. We don't, we don't have mass deportations, despite you'll, the fact that some politicians will talk about it. That's pretty much outside the boundary in American politics. As politicians move toward the center, they're not going to talk about mass deportations anymore. At the same time, we exploit the heck out of these people. They don't have any rights. They don't have any health care. It is like a little parallel society. Um, they can go to school. They can, they can be educated. Um, they can show up at the hospital and get emergency care. Um, but these workers are very, very poorly protected in, in the United States. Um, Japan is much better at protecting um, uh, migrant workers than the United States is. So I'm just going to leave you with this potential solution, which I didn't talk about. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how promising um, this is as a solution. Um, but Japan leads the world in, in the, the science of robotics. And um, this is a uh, robotic sort of nursing kind of worker. Um, you may have seen on the news there's another robot that looks more human. Um, apparently, that freaked out some people. And so there's some <laughs> notion that this sort of you know, cute little animal kind of character, a little Hello Kitty <laughs> kind of uh, aesthetic going on, that that's actually more uh, reassuring to people than, um, than something else. But, but it's a, another potential solution. We don't know the limits of technology on being able to provide um, for these missing workers. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there and have some Q&A or whatever. Thank you. Thank you.